hey, how do you get Social Security Disability? You meet the criteria for Social Security Disability, of course. Um, I'm Dr. Todd Finnerty. I'm a psychologist. I spent around 19 years um, working inside a state disability determination service here in Ohio, uh, helping to make decisions on Social Security Disability cases. So I thought I'd talk about it. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, how, how to qualify for Social Security Disability uh, from a mental disorders perspective. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it mostly in general and I won't get into like really niche stuff, but in terms of things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, it's kind of mostly what I'll focus on in this one. I could do other videos later if people are interested in things like intellectual disability. But um, so, and one thing that sort of made me think of it is, you know, I've focused a lot on VA disability cases lately and the VA is proposing changes, um, which include functional domains, but they're different functional domains than the ones that Social Security Disability uses, uh, a bit different approach. So I thought, well, why don't I talk a little bit about what Social Security is doing? And of course, I went through mental disorder listings changes with them a while back where they changed their system and they changed the functional domains they used. But um, so if you think about it, that Social Security has what they call mental disorder listings. And I'll link to all these in the description below. <laughs> really, the, the, the description isn't here below me on the ground. <laughs> but we always, you know, it's like, let's point. Here, here it is. But um, so initially, with each class, of different types of classes of disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD will have their own listing, but the listings are all pretty similar. And so they start with like the A, the A criteria of the listing. And it's very much like, do you have a diagnosis, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, Social Security would call it a medically determinable impairment, but um, a the A criteria really mostly walks you through a diagnosis. Really, it's not quite that simple. There are different symptoms and things, but um, the, the main part of that is, you know, symptoms that are like depression or symptoms that are like anxiety or symptoms that are like PTSD, right? You can look at those if you're interested in different listings. There, I'll link to it below. But uh, the next one is kind of what we think about in terms of functional domains, the B criteria. And so you'd have, there's four of them. And to meet a listing, which would be your grant, assuming you meet all the economic qualifications you know what i mean and, uh, you qualify for the program the disabilities lasted a year or may be expected to result in death you're working less than substantial gainful activity in terms of the amount of money you're making things like that make sure all that's checked off of course but in terms of those four functional requirements the b criteria uh the ones that are here now they used to be different but um you need an extreme limitation of one, extreme doesn't get rated too often, or marked a marked limitation in two of them in order to sort of meet a listing, right? And those are understand, remember, or apply information, interact with others, right? Social interactions, things like that. Your ability to concentrate, per persist, persistence, concentrate, persist, or maintain pace, and your ability to adapt or manage oneself. And that's not just activities of daily living, which was an old domain that they used to have, but it's also, so, uh, <clears throat> sorry, stress tolerance, you know, dealing dealing with stress, you know. Um, and it, interestingly, it takes a place, there used to be decompensations, right? They, like in, in which kind of a lot of times took the place of how many times we were hospitalized, but really, it's, you know, uh, decompensation would be, you know, plummet your functioning just kind of plummeting and, and being bad for a while right really bad <clears throat> now if you don't meet these marked limitation in two of these like your ability to interact with others is markedly impaired or and your ability to concentrate persist and maintain pace markedly impaired if you don't have two maybe you go on to the c criteria right and that is if you have like a of a chronic difficulty like um uh, your mental disorder in this listing category is serious and persistent. 
That is, you have a medically documented history of the existence of the disorder over a period of at least two years, and there's evidence of both medical treatment, mental health therapy, psychosocial supports, or a highly structured setting that is ongoing and that diminishes the symptoms and signs of your mental disorder. Basically, you're in a structured setting and, and you're getting this, this structure, this treatment, things you're getting kind of reduces the how bad it looks, but it's still pretty bad. And then the second piece that you also need is marginal adjustment. That is, you have minimal capacity to adapt to changes in your environment or to demands that are not already part of your daily life. And so in the past, we'd even say, you know, you know, you'd be expected to decompensate with any increased stressors too. You know what I mean? So it's like your, your ability to deal with frustration, regulate your emotions, deal, tolerate stress. So marginal that one more straw on your back is going to break, right? Like the straw that broke the camel's back, you're, it's going to, right? So that's the mental listings, right? <laughs> In a, in a very brief overview. So those, you know, those are the kind of functional domains people look at in Social Security. And I'm, I bring it up because we could compare it to the mental disorders proposals for the VA, uh, which are a bit different. Um, maybe a little more complex <laughs> unnecessarily uh, based on, uh, you know, the HUDAS 2.0, things like that uh, with the World Health Organization that are not just mental mental disorders but also trying to take in into account you know the impact of a back problem or something like that right physical issues um now from there let's say let's say the the person reviewing your case for social security says bah, they don't meet a listing you know what i mean <laughs> so they'll have to go on and do what would be but if it's severe enough not to say if it's like so not severe they they wouldn't need to to complete the after this this is the psychiatric review technique let's say there's a form even the psychiatric review technique form the prt uh, in fact i'll put the forms in the description too if you want to look at the forms that'll be you can google them or i'll give you a link something like that um for fun just like you like to look at dbqs you can look at the forms that these are the forms that the a reviewer would look at so an adjudicator works in the disability determination service kind of collects all of the evidence up um and there's a good chance that they may actually draft like a proposed decision on the case and then it goes to doctors who work you know and maybe like a, a ce examiner a con consultative examiner they might have sent it out kind of like a cmp in a va case they might have sent it out for an examiner and that's part of the evidence too and comes in and but then a different doctor that works <laughs> in in-house like uh, and reviews all the records would kind of take a look at it and would fill out these forms and so like a psychologist or a psychiatrist um an in-house consultant medical consultant would uh go through and fill out do a psychiatric review technique and then this mental residual functional capacity form if a listing isn't met right uh and it's severe you know enough to have restrictions or limitations some kind of impairment there so that, that's a little long-winded for you sorry <laughs> but one reason is um social security also has what they would consider uh you know mental mental abilities needed for any job they also note like mental abilities that are needed for unskilled work or semi-skilled work and, and these are some weird qualitative descriptions in there that aren't perfect and are well defined but but um <clears throat> so on this mental residual functional capacity typically if you said something was markedly impaired they wouldn't we'd say marked and then extreme would be even higher but marked would be too much they wouldn't be able to do it but of course the most important thing is that functional narrative to to say they're not able to do this uh so just saying marked isn't always really enough you kind of have to justify it and, and the important part is the narrative to say they can do this or they can't do this you know what i mean so i printed it out just for fun i'll, I'll link to it below as well the the in terms of the the references but i'm just free to how about we'll skip all not worry about the semi-skilled and skilled work and and all that since a lot of times 
people are thinking when they come to Social Security, they're like, I can't work. <laughs> so, so what are the, what are the what are some of the mental abilities that Social Security says? Yeah, if you can't do this, you you probably you can't work because Social Security says these are abilities needed for any job. So if it's needed for any job, that's probably a job you get. You know, there's no other job, right? Because it's any job. So Social Security thinks, and there's a list of them. So we're back to if you've seen some of my other videos. Uh, apparently, I've fallen into just reading things. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, a mental ability needed for any job. I'm hiding my. Here we go. Uh, the ability to remember locations and work like procedures. Gotta be able to do that to work. The ability to understand and remember very short and simple instructions. The ability to carry out very short and simple instructions. The ability to maintain concentration and attention for extended periods. For example, the approximately two hour segments between arrival and first break, lunch, second break, and departure. That's kind of a stereotypical job there. Uh, the ability to perform activities within a schedule, maintain regular attendance, and be punctual within customary tolerances. You know, you gotta be able to show up, <laughs> sir, sure. The ability to su sustain an ordinary routine without special supervision, you know, doing things independent, <laughs> independently, right? And one thing they look at is, you know, how well you're able to do something independently, appropriately, right? You know, be consistent at things, be able to sustain things, you know, be efficient with things, effective. So how about the ability to work in coordination with or proximity to others without being unduly distracted by them. That counts as is needed for any job, right? So not a lot of jobs where you're just kind of, you know, in your own room with weird things on the wall. You know, <laughs> even I have to work with other people. Who am I kidding? <laughs> here's, here's a big one that, you know, it's, it's very broad and vague, but tends to get used a lot. The ability to complete a normal work day and work week without interruptions from psychologically based symptoms and to perform at a consistent pace without an unreasonable number and length of rest periods, right? So it's like any job you need to be able to, you know, complete the work that you need to be able to st sustain stuff without having all these mental health symptoms coming at you and keeping you from doing your job right it's, it's yeah <laughs> it's a uh, it's a little vague but you know it's def definitely it makes sense right you need to be able to make simple work related work related decisions you need to be able to be aware of normal hazards and take appropriate precautions right you need to be able to ask simple questions or request assistance also the ability to accept instructions and respond appropriately to criticism from supervisors. Otherwise, if you flip them the bird, you're gonna, you're gonna, you may, you may end up uh, getting escorted out the door, right? At some point, if if your, you know, your anger is too out of control or something like that, right? You also, on the same note, have to be able to get along with coworkers or peers without unduly distracting them or exhibiting behavioral extremes, right? And the last one I'll talk about here is uh, dealing with changes in a routine work setting, right? The ability to respond appropriately to, to changes in a routine work setting. And sometimes you, people say, oh, they can't deal with stress, something like that. And, and it's, that's often criticized as being overly vague. But sometimes with Social Security, they say one ability needed for any job is to be able to deal with stress changes right changes in the work setting adapt to changes and that can be stressful right those changes so uh responding appropriately to changes is one way to sort of operationalize dealing with stress it's not the only thing but but um it's one thing to think about and this of course you can see there's a bunch of other abilities too you don't want me to read the whole form <laughs> but those sometimes you'll see attorneys or other people will, will send this form out and and ask doctors to complete it but it's available publicly online and you know i guess i'll put it in the description maybe or you know at least a link to this <clears throat> uh, you see it 
MRFC or mental residual functional capacity. Um, and those, the ones I listed, uh, and of course, POMS is the thing with lots of social security regulations that, you know, it's an ability needed for any job, right? And uh, along with those functional domains, there's th things to think about in terms of um, how impaired someone is, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you have questions about social security disability and whether, <laughs> whether somebody kind of meets a listing, doesn't meet a listing, you know, it's certainly something I do exams for. It it's kind of can be kind of involved in terms of how do we determine how impaired somebody is, right? And it's it can be kind of a subjective process, but getting lots of functional information to see just, you know, how, how they are in their, daily, in their daily lives, right? So thanks again. That's kind of a quick one, but maybe it wasn't. I don't know, maybe it was really long for you. I don't know. Sorry if it was. <laughs> But hopefully, you know, you've learned a little something. Thanks. Chapter 1.